Hello and welcome to another edition of Out of the Blue. I'm Mike Browning. A more perfect union, MTSU celebrated Constitution Day on the 225th anniversary of the document signing in 1787. MTSU has celebrated the historic event since 2005. This year, hundreds in the MTSU community celebrated the document's ideas and ideals by reading it aloud in locations across campus. The celebration culminated with a rare federal district court naturalization ceremony, welcoming 288 new citizens, including three MTSU students. This is new citizens only. States District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee, the Honorable Joe B. Brown, Magistrate Judge presiding. Generations have crossed land and ocean because of the belief that in America, all things are possible. Let us forever uphold the ideals the framers enshrined in our Constitution, and let us never cease in our pursuit of the more perfect union they imagined so many years ago. MTSU Center for Educational Media in the College of Education partnered with the Tennessee Department of Education to deliver a live TV surprise party for top schools across Tennessee. Broadcast live from Kenrose Elementary in Brentwood, the event included U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, Governor Bill Haslam, and Tennessee Commissioner of Education Kevin Hoffman. The live broadcast was directed by MTSU's audiovisual services and included a giant projection screen to bring participants together from across the state and the nation. Dr. Webb had the teachers here stand up. I'm gonna ask them to stand up, but all those folks watching uh, on Skype and every other way, if the teachers there would all stand up and if everybody in all these locations would cheer for the teachers, we would be most grateful. Please stand up teachers here and everywhere else. The Tennessee school celebrated performance in the top 5% statewide, along with schools who achieved the most progress. As you know, MTSU annually produces the most teachers of any university in the state. MTSU officially dedicated the new $65 million student union during a special ceremony September 19th, after opening on August 24th. The new 211,000 square foot building has quickly become the community gathering place in vision. This building is the newest gathering place for our students. It's a place where they can recharge, collaborate, or simply unwind. And it is my hope and is our hope that this new union will create an environment for our students and our faculty and those who visit that will also help to strengthen our sense of community at this university. It has already become a trendy place. You just need to walk through the facility for our students and others to gather. And we are tremendously excited about this grand opening of this new facility and about the impact that it will have on our campus. It features a new and expanded home for our Phillips Bookstore, a 640-seat food court, and a 102-seat casual dining restaurant. It has an 840 seat ballroom, a 95 seat theater, plus a game room, 
a collaborative computer center, and a workplace for our student governments, the Center for Student Involvement and Leadership, and other offices for student-focused activities. I would like to first thank all of you for being here on this monumental day. You are all here to witness a huge step to the future for Middle Tennessee State University. It started in 2006 with a resolution by a student, and today we stand in front of the concrete evidence that the students have a voice here at MTSU. MTSU freshmen could not have been more inspired than by Tori McClure at the annual University Convocation at Murphy Center. The best-selling author of Pearl in the Storm captivated her Murphy Center audience with reflections on her solo rowing trip across the Atlantic amid sea-tossing storm. The hurricane hit me the morning of September 5th. The boat capsized five or six times. You're thinking she's a university president. Can she not count to six? Was it five or was it six? It doesn't matter whether a woman is skied to the pole or rowed across an ocean. The true tests of courage and resourcefulness occur here in civilization. No one of us can escape the heartbreaking, soul-testing, gut-wrenching experiences that go into being a human being. When I think of daring mighty things, I think of daring difficult things like fighting poverty, ignorance, racism, and despair. I accepted the challenges of a continent and an ocean but people who are truly great do things that are far more daring. They challenge the thinking of their eras. New students in the room today, you are embarking on the ocean that is university life. Do not doubt that you are ready. Do not doubt that you have what you need. There are resources all around you. Do not go it alone. McClure's book was the 2012 summer reading selection. MTSU continues to strengthen its credentials as a scientific research institution. The university recently became one of 105 universities in the country to gain full membership with the Oak Ridge Associated Universities. The Vice President of University Partnerships, Dr. Arlene Garrison, presented President Sidney McPhee with a plaque commemorating the achievement. The promotion allows MTSU faculty and students an opportunity to land members-only research grants and internships and a gateway to laboratory research at federal facilities. MTSU began the new academic year with two new deans. Dr. Robert Bud Fisher is the new dean of the College of Basic and Applied Sciences, replacing Dr. Tom Cheatham. Fisher comes to MTSU from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where he had served as the biology chair since 2008. And Bonnie J. Allen joined the MTSU community as dean of MTSU's James E. Walker Library. Allen had previously served as the Dean of the Libraries at University of Montana. Well, there was a time when science and technology were viewed as mostly male passions. That myth has long been dispelled. For more than 15 years, MTSU has helped young girls expand their horizons by opening their eyes to the possibilities in the so-called STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Nearly 500 middle school girls from across Tennessee recently participated in the 16th annual Expanding Your Horizons in Math and Sciences Conference. Without a doubt, the educational experience was hands-on. This is the Expanding Your Horizons in Math and Science Conference for middle and high school girls. This conference has been going on since 1976. It was started by a group of women in the San Francisco area who we're asking themselves, where are the girls in advanced math and science classes in high school? Where are the girls in the STEM majors in college? So they looked at several strategies to try to encourage girls to get engaged in STEM. And this conference, this hands-on conference, is the one that worked. What's another kind of worm that you give medicine for probably once a month? Heartworms, that's exactly right. Now, I have done a math workshop and the windmill workshop. We're getting the DNA of a kiwi and finding it and putting it in a test tube. This EYH conference is international in scope. It's held in countries all around the world. So we are very fortunate to have one here at MTSU. There's also another EYH in Tennessee at the University of Memphis. But we want more across Tennessee. We want more in the South because we see that the girls who attend EYH are becoming STEM majors in college and are becoming STEM professionals. 
What would happen if a reverend and a rabbi talked about the Ten Commandments? You can find out by reading the book Mount and Mountain by MTSU adjunct professor Dr. Rami Shapiro and Baptist minister Michael Smith. Or you can listen to MTSU's On the Record with Jenna Loeb. Here's a clip of her interview. On number three, you shall not take the name of your God in vain. People always told me saying GD is asking God to damn something else, not damning God. Is that just a convenient little loophole? Uh, I don't know about a convenient loophole, but it has nothing to do with the commandment. <laughs> that is so Southern culture. That is the play. total misinterpretation of the commandment. It is. Taking God's, because that's what we call taking God's name in vain in popular culture. Yeah. You shall not cuss would be how a Southerner uh -huh. probably would have written it. But what it's about, in my opinion, Rami may take a different take, I think it's about misusing the reputation of God uh, in support of things that God doesn't want anything to do with. Yeah, and I think it, it can apply in court situation where you're swearing, on, you know, I, this is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. But it's also, um, if this isn't true, may God strike me down. Oh, look, nothing happened, so therefore it must be true. I mean, that's taking God's name in vain. Yeah. Volume 2 of their dialogue on the Sermon on the Mount is currently being published. To listen to the full half hour on the record program, go to mtsunews.com and click audio clip. Well, kicking off the new academic year, MTSU President Sidney McPhee delivered the State of the University Address with a message stressing a second century even more committed to enhancing student success. In his address during the fall faculty meeting, Dr. McPhee highlighted ongoing efforts to put students first, a strategic plan for enrollment management, an academic alert program, and added academic counselors who help students throughout their entire time at MTSU. Students will remember those faculty and staff members who challenge them the most, not the least. They will remember the people who reached out, who connected with them. President McPhee singled out a number of professors and staff for their exceptional commitment to ensuring student success. More than a dozen professors were honored for outstanding teaching. And one professor was highly honored with the annual Career Achievement Award. I am pleased to announce that this year's recipient of the Career Achievement Award is Dr. Larry Burris from the School of Journalism. <laughs> Dr. Burris, please come forward. I was giving a tour recently around the campus and was showing the, a family uh, the aerospace facilities, the recording industry facilities, the new student union, the new education building. And one of the younger children, about seven years old, said, this is all really nice, but where's the university? <laughs> and, and I got to thinking about, well, where exactly is the university? And I'm afraid I have to disagree with, with Dr. McPhee. Uh, we are not at MTSU. Faculty, staff, and students are MTSU. Dr. Burris, a professor of journalism, is widely known for his teaching and research in journalism and continues to practice the craft with contemporary commentary. That is the market that this is designed to go for. That those of us who just drive around town. This is not just a recording studio. This is not just a flight school. This is not just a university.
This is MTSU, home of Tennessee's best. Nissan LEAF cars were recently added to MTSU's motor pool thanks to a donation from Nissan North America. Nissan's Director of Parts Quality Engineering was on hand for this big campus announcement. Uh, but with the donations of these two uh, zero emission LEAF vehicles, it also shows our dedication to our relationship with the global universe, uh, with what we're doing here. Uh, it's great also because MTSU also develops those relationships with a long-standing commitment to their students to develop them to improve not only their lives, but the global community as well. Nissan also donated to the university three charging stations for use by students, faculty, staff, as well as visitors to the MTSU campus. An MTSU professor's plug-in hybrid retrofit kit continues to gain national and international attention, including ABC Yahoo's This Could Be Big. Engineer professor Dr. Charles Perry's wheel hub motor kit is installed in the space between the brake mechanism and the hub, generating more electricity while the vehicle is driven. Well, trips of 30 miles or less under 40 miles per hour can be made with 10 to 15 horsepower electric motors powered by extra batteries installed in the car's trunk. A video of Perry's invention, produced by MTSU's Audio and Visual Services, has received more than 97,000 views on YouTube, a strong indication of just how interested the public is in Perry's innovation. Let's take a look. The real innovation in this technology of being able to convert any car to a plug-in hybrid automobile is how do you add electric traction. There have been many approaches to this. Some of them involve interrupting the drive shaft if it's a rear wheel car. Others use a technique where they drive through the lug nuts. But we wanted a technique by which it was transparent visually and also performance wise. So what we have done is taken the space that exists around the rear wheel brake structure and packaged a DC brushless motor. Now, in this application, what we have done is taken the suspension components on this car, a 94 Honda, and we have packaged the stator magnets all the way around the back side of the rotor. These are electromagnets that switch on and off at the proper intervals as controlled by three Hall effect sensors. This is a three phase DC brushless motor for maximum amount of torque. The permanent magnets are on the back side of this rotor. There's an array of permanent magnets, 40 permanent magnets on this rotor, and when the system is actuated, this turns into a DC brushless motor with 200 foot-pounds of torque. There's one on each side of the car. I'm gonna have the motor turned on now so you can see how it rotates. Go ahead and turn it on. Now this is in static operation. In actual operation, you start accelerating with the car, then the traction motors turn on and supplement or augment the electric, the traction provided by the gasoline engine, thereby reducing the amount of gasoline required. In actual operation, this system will double your mileage in town. So you see it's, and both sides are running, both sides are identical. All right, you can turn the motor off now, thank you. This technology is designed for around the town usage. There's a well-known statistic that on any given day in the United States, 80% of us drive 40 miles or less at 45 miles an hour or less. That is the market that this is designed to go for. That the, those of us who just drive around town, what happens when you get out on interstate and go above a certain uh, miles per hour, the system will automatically cut off and becomes transparent. When the system is not operating, 
the wheel turns just like it normally does and you don't even know it's there. Packaging of this motor without modifying the wheel mounts on the car, just as you see, this is the rotor. This is what we've added. It wraps around the brake structure and then we just add the wheel and the car operates as normal. Now let's consider the battery pack and the controllers that are mounted in the back of this vehicle. Like any plug-in hybrid, it requires a battery and a controller and an operating system to control it. In this application, we have a lithium ion phosphate battery here in the rear of this 94 Honda wagon that's rated for 80 volts and 100 amps. It supplies the power to each of the DC brushless traction motors that we discussed just a moment ago. This particular application, we use two DC brushless motor controllers mounted on the back of the battery pack. This particular system is larger than it needs to be because this is a research vehicle and we designed it to get the data and operation so we put a little larger battery than we really needed. In the actual operation I mentioned it'll be about the size of a carry-on bag for an aircraft. As I mentioned earlier in hybrid mode which we have proved with this laboratory prototype it doubles the mileage while you're in hybrid mode. So this, nearly none, this is all off-the-shelf components. There's really no great innovation in the battery or the controllers. These are off-the-shelf components. As I mentioned earlier, the innovation that is patented is how we add the electric traction. Dr. Perry is a former IBM electrical engineer who was awarded 40 patents during his career there. The Tennessee Technology Council, a state agency that offers grants to help Tennessee innovators take their innovations from the lab to the marketplace, awarded Perry's kit first place. We'll be right back. And when that happens, when a young person seems lost and afraid, I tell them now is the time to make a philosopher's pie. We started in 1911 with a clear mission to train Tennessee's best teachers. For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more. Nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. Being True Blue is giving your all on and off the court. My name is Ebony Rowe and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is embracing unique perspectives. My name is Iris Montes and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is helping students solve real world problems. My name is Cliff Ricketts and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is making the world a safer place. My name is Sam Willie, and I am True Blue. Well, the rivalry continues, and once again, you can show whether you bleed blue by donating blood during the third year battle between MTSU and Western Kentucky. It's a blood drive competition, so go out and donate blood at the MTSU Rec Center by making appointments for October 29th, 30th, or 31st. To do so, visit www.redcrossblood.org slash MTSU WKU, and walk-ins are welcome. The winner will be announced at halftime of the November 1st game with the Hilltoppers in Bowling Green. Go Blue! Well, we all know that life can be confusing and even perplexing at times. As our commentator Sage Bob Pondillo suggests, 
Sometimes it helps to simplify. One of the biggest joys of my life is working with young people here at MTSU, not just the teaching, which is part of my job, but actually sitting down and visiting with a student over a cup of coffee and listening to them relate their struggles with certain ideas or with life in general. And when that happens, when a young person seems lost and afraid, I tell them, now's the time, a perfect time, to bake the philosopher's pie. What we do is we draw a circle, then we divide the circle into three parts. In one third, we write the word ontology, or what is real. In the next third, we think about knowledge and write the word epistemology, or what is true. And in the last third, we write the word axiology, or what is valuable or ethical. And then it begins. We talk and we think and we write. And we just try to figure things out by asking those three questions. What is real, what is true, and what is valuable? And that's it. And by using the simple philosopher's pie, I often see the early stages of clarity arriving on my students' face. Now these ideas are nothing new. In fact, when they do it, I tell them to listen carefully because they'll hear the faint voices of the classical sages from where the philosopher's pie was first baked in ancient Greece in the 6th century BC. These are the ideas that came before Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. These are the bedrock questions that all of us must eventually ask. What is real? What is true? What is valuable? I also explained that being in college is an excellent place to bake a philosopher's pie. Why? Because college students are experiencing huge transitions, leaving high school, often leaving home, being challenged by new ideas finding themselves way out of their old comfort zones. And being a college student means young people are thrust into a strange transitional twilight zone where boys are almost but not quite men and girls are nearly but not yet women. It's a time of change, of doubt, and of considering or reconsidering what's often called first principles. But there are other times to bake the philosopher's pie too, at the birth of a child, at the death of a loved one, or a sickness, or a relationship when getting a new job or losing one, any time one experiences transition or change, that's the time to head to the seashore or the mountaintop or the privacy of one's own room and in that quiet place ask, what is real, what is true, what is valuable? And then listen carefully to what emerges from the silence and write those answers down. Does it work? Human beings have been doing it for millennia Great ethical philosophies and world religions have grown from it. Maybe next time you find yourself in a time of transition, you might try it too. And let me know how that works out for you. For Out of the Blue, I'm Bob Pondillo. For more information on MTSU News, be sure to go to mtsunews.com. That's it for this edition of Out of the Blue. Until next time, stay true blue.